I think we'll probably go ahead and get rolling since it's now hit 11. Um, I'm Christopher Passion. Carlos Perez is my team lead. He's going to go ahead and kick us off. And today we're going to be starting a new, new web series that we're going to be attempting to put on monthly where we just talk about some kind of tool or tactic that we think is interesting and that we want to make other people aware of so that you can consider adding it to your tool set. So with that, uh, Carlos, would you go ahead and get us started? Sure. So as Chris mentioned, my name is Carlos Perez. I am the lead for the research team. And today we're going to start talking about BOFs, uh, specifically on situational awareness BOFs. Uh, and just to give you guys perspective of all of the things that we do nowadays because um, we're very well known for all of our pen testing, red teaming, but in addition to that, we have multiple additional services that we provide. So we provide the typical security testing analysis when we go in and help you guys with IoT hardware assessments. We do red and blue and purple teaming penetration testing and we also do mobile and web testing. In addition to that, we can also assist in program assessments and compliance. At the end of the day, security is a human issue. It's a business process issue more than a technical one. So we can assist you guys with this. In addition to that, we can also help you with your security program management, helping you build that program and also even provide even virtual CISO uh in addition to that we have a remediation assistance and training in fact we're going to be doing a training this week i'm going to be teaching a this is month fundamentals class uh this thursday and friday when we're going to spend two glorious days talking about what is sysmon how to configure sysmon deploy it and how to actually configure sysmon to be able to catch all types of malicious behavior to enhance your logging. Uh, we also have our remediation service where we will go in and help you guys remediate and fix what has been found either from an attack emulation point of view or from after an insert response, actually help you rebuild and address multiple issues. And as many of you know, we also provide insert response and forensics which is now the popular service for us and now with uh, everything that has been happening with Exchange Server. Um, so we do provide a response, threat hunting, tabletop exercises, and even malware analysis. So as you can see, we're a very well-rounded consultancy that can provide services for all of your technical security needs. So yeah, thank so, you for that uh, quick introduction, Carlos. Um, as he said, today we are going to be focusing on beacon object files and how they might be something that you want to incorporate into your tool set. If you utilize Cobalt Strike, if that's a tool that you've purchased, then you are likely already have had some sort of introduction to beacon object files. It's a feature that Cobalt Strike added in 4.1, and it's continued to gain some traction in the community as a technique that you can use with that. Also recently, um, you can see that link on the bottom of this page. If you don't have Cobalt Strike, um, Kevin Hobris, who's another researcher on our team, recently released that cough loader project, which allows you to take beacon object files and either test them standalone outside of Cobalt Strike, or you can attempt to integrate that project into your own internal implant or whatever other tool chain of interest you have to try and uh, utilize this technique in different areas. So with that said, what exactly is a beacon object file? At its core, it's a common object file format file, or also known as a cough file, which is to say it's your C, your C++ code, some kind of native code that's compiled into an object file, but it hasn't been run through a linker. So it's not 
not a finalized exe or dll that the system could natively just start up and run something that makes a beacon object file a little bit different from just a standard object file is there's some special syntax sugar that can kind of be added in on top and they make it a little bit easier for us as developers to try and produce things that uh, can be usable in a quick and efficient fashion. And those two things are going to be its dynamic function resolution, which as of Co Cobalt Strike 4.2, allows you to call up to 32 Windows APIs using that special syntax, which we'll look at in just a minute. And it also gives you access to the BOF C API, which is Beacon's built-in functions. Uh, Beacon is just the name of Cobalt Strike's implant. And that allows you to do things like check if it's running as admin through a convenience function or return output to the user, things of that nature. It's really kind of your convenience functions that you just need to make it work. And again, if you don't have access to Cobalt Strike, I know not everyone is necessarily either large enough or doesn't want to pay for that tool, you can check out that cough loader project and look at incorporating that technique into your own tool chains. So let's just look at a quick example of what a BOF file looks like. At the end of the day, like I said, it's your standard native code compiled into an object file. So you have your normal Windows headers, and then you have the include beacon.h. That's what's going to give you access to the BOF C API. So that's why we're including that. Next, you're going to see these two decl spec imports. That's just doing uh, decl spec DLL import. And then after that, it looks like a regular function prototype. So you have your return, your calling convention. And then the thing that makes the dynamic function resolution work is you have some name, dollar sign, some other name. The first name is your, your DLL that this is going to get loaded from. So in this case, DS get DC name A is going to be found in net API 32.dll. So really at the end of the day, this is just giving you a shortcut to having to manually handle your load library and your get proc address call. Other than that, this reads and looks like a standard function prototype. After that, you have your entry point. By convention for BOF, that's going to be a function called go. It can take some arguments. The BOF C API gives you convenience functions for actually handling those arguments and parsing them out. That's not utilized in this quick example. After that, works like a normal C or C++ program. You declare your variables, you call functions, you can call the BOF C API. And notably, you do need to handle things like freeing your memory. So this is freeing the memory that was allocated by this function. If you don't do that, you're going to have a memory leak, just like you would if you were running this in your own implant or your own code. And this example was just taken from Cobalt Strike's own uh, beacon object file introduction. We'll talk more about the code that we've introduced in just a little bit. So why should you care about BOF and what's some of its pros and cons? Cobalt Strike site this themselves outlines this quite well. If you want a deeper dive, that's an area that you can go look after this presentation. But condensed, you're breaking away from the fork and exec model that Cobalt Strike has. So if you're using cough loader and integrating this into your own tooling, your main advantage is just being able to utilize the techniques that people are putting out for Cobalt Strike in a quick fashion. Inside of Cobalt Strike itself, most actions use that fork and exec model where you're either using CMD or PowerShell or spawning something in some kind of code injection technique to start something, read the output from it, and then let it die. So that's great for stability in your implant. A lot of things can go wrong in your post-exploitation techniques, but at the end of the day, it's being started in some other child process. If it throws an exception and everything dies, 
your main implant's still gonna keep calling home and you can keep trying to do other things in advance. But that leaves a lot of indicators of compromise. You're going to be having a lot of process start events that you're leaving in Windows logs. Uh, you might um, possibly trigger other um, EDR solutions or AV solutions because of the code injections and other things that make the fork and exec model work. So how are we getting that advantage? Well, everything is running within Beacon or the implant's address space. So if anything inside of your Beacon object file breaks, your implant is dead. Uh, that doesn't matter if you've integrated cough loader into something or if you're using Beacon object files inside of Cobalt Strike itself. If it's because of a coding error, you do something that Cobalt Strike's loader doesn't like, um, or you just have some unhandled exception, if something goes wrong, dead implant, you have to start over or hope that you already had spawned off something else, in which case you yourself kind of followed the fork and exec model. So something that's, you know, maybe a positive, maybe a negative based on who you are. By default, you're going to end up coding these things in some native coding language. So if you're someone who's used to coding C or C++ code, you probably see that as a positive. You can just go in, do something that you're used to, and get usable uh, code out of it, usable techniques. Likewise, if you're more used to C Sharp, then that's not by default going to be supported. I do want to give a call out to the boff.net project. It's not something that I have extensively utilized because I'm by trade a C programmer, but that is an option and something that the community as a whole has utilized where boff.net gives you the common runtime language getting loaded inside of your implant and then some helper functions to call your assemblies that you have compiled instead of using utilizing something like the execute assembly feature that Cobalt Strike provides. So we've done a lot of talking about what BOF is. We've looked at the code. Now let's look at for Cobalt Strike itself, how do I actually take some BOFs that are already ready to go loaded into Cobalt Strike? So to that end, we're gonna come out here to GitHub. And the thing we're going to look at is Trusted Sex Public GitHub repo and the Cobalt Strike Situational Awareness BOF repo. Inside of here, we have a link out to a blog post I wrote that goes into a much more just developer-centric uh, dive on BOF and some of those things that the loader doesn't appreciate and considerations that you might want to have as you're writing them. Otherwise, you can see there are a ton of commands implemented. So if you utilize Cobalt Strike, I strongly suggest coming out here and checking this out. And we do accept pull requests. There have been multiple people externally to Cobalt or to Trusted Sec rather, who have added features and some of those commands to this project. And we'd be more than happy to review any code or ideas that you have for contributing to this repository. But with that out of the way, you can just come here, either clone it down, or if you don't plan on adding anything, you can just download the zip. We already have all of the object files compiled and ready to go for you. After that, you're just going to want to extract that. And then come over to your Cobalt Strike client, open up the script manager, and we're going to go ahead and load that in. So it's already changed directory into it. You just go into your download folder and you're gonna want to load this sa.cna. This is the file that properly registers all of the commands in BOF files that we have presented with Cobalt Strike. So if you're used to Cobalt Strike, you can use help to list off all the commands now that we've loaded that CNA file, there are other commands here that typically would not be. So things like all of these SC commands, those are being presented from the CNA file that we just loaded into Cobalt Strike. Now, that's the way that we've chosen to manage 
buffs and how they get loaded into Cobalt Strike. There are other options, however. You can just have your raw object files in some folder, and you can call them with inline execute. So inline execute is a command that was added in Cobalt Strike 4.1. You give it a path to an object file, and you give it arguments. And I would strongly discourage you from doing that for anything outside of your initial development testing. The reason for that being, when you do the nice packaging within CNA, it gives your end users nice convenient commands where they can just say something like IP config. They don't have to say inline execute, the path to the IP config, object file, optionally any arguments if you were taking them. Also, when you use inline execute, the only type of argument that you can send is a character string. You can't pack integers or wide character strings or binary blobs to send. So if you're needing to do anything more complex, you really want to package it inside of a CNA file using the sleep language. Now, there's multiple ways that you can choose to group these things. So if we look at that CNA file, you'll see that we've chosen to package all of those different commands into one CNA file. So this is quite a long file at that point, but you have the places where we're registering those commands and their help output. And then we have the actual code that gets called when something like ipconfig is ran. Having them all in one allows your end user to just click something, get access to all of those. If you do them individually, then you can be a little more focused and don't have to have a thousand line CNA file. We just group them by public and private. Obviously what you see in our GitHub repository is what's public. We also have some stuff internally that we don't feel is appropriate to share. And that's how we've chosen to manage it. One thing I want to bring to your attention, if you're used to programming CNA files and in inside of sleep, you might be aware that you can include CNA files from other CNA files. Now, the way that you likely reference the object file is using the script resource helper. That will work differently if it's being included by some master file. Specifically, instead of being in reference to the script itself that's calling script resource, it'll be in reference to the file doing all of the includes. So you might need to change some of your workflows if that's how you're going to handle this. So for the rest of today, before we get to questions, we're just going to talk about five commands that are relatively simple. We're going to run them, talk about my, why you might want to utilize them. So the first one we're going to look at is uptime. These are all registered. In this case, this one doesn't really have much help because it does what it says on the tin and doesn't take any arguments. Uptime returns how long the system's been booted and how long it's been running. So in this case, what information might we want to glean from here? Well, this is all our situational awareness tools. This told us that this box has been running for less than a day. So in that case, I can probably infer that the user likely doesn't just close their laptop lid and sleep at the end of the day. So I might want to look for throwing down some kind of user level or system level persistence. Likewise, if that had said, you know, two weeks plus, they're probably either just sleeping their machine or maybe I'm on some server that just hasn't needed to reboot for updates. So then maybe I would decide that it's more worth it to me to live out of memory than throwing down some files on disk and establishing persistence that way. Resources is another one we have. Also, I just want to point out that uptime and resources were both added by community members. Um, so thank you to the folks that added those into this repository. Resources doesn't give us a ton of information. Total system memory, how much is in use? Total disk space, how much is in use? Really, some of the most that you can infer from that is the potential that you're running in some kind of virtualized environment and not on actual hardware. So like in this case, 
60 gigabyte hard drives aren't really sold, or not anymore at least. And it's highly unlikely I'm on an actual machine that just has a 60 gigabyte hard drive and two gigs per in. So I can probably infer maybe I'm in some virtualized Citrix environment, maybe I'm in some other kind of test range or virtual environment. So some information you can get from that. You'd likely actually go down and try and figure that out at that point if that was something you cared about. We have route print. Lists out the IPv4 routes. So in today's world, we got a lot of folks working from home, working through VPNs. Something like being able to print out the routing table might tell you what's being exposed from the other side of the VPN so that you have an idea of where maybe you want to throw down a SOX proxy and start trying to scan into some of those target networks. We can also list off environment variables, might give you some ideas of things that the user has in their path, maybe potential op opportunities for persisting, points out things like the logon server. There's just generally useful information that you might be able to pull from environment variables. And again, as I'm running these commands, I'm not starting things like cmd.exe to purely give me the environment variables or running um, route to being able to print the routing table. These are all things that are just executing against the Windows API inside of our beacon process itself. And the last one we're going to just quick run today is who am I? So who am I currently executing as? What groups am I a part of both in the domain and locally on this computer? And what privileges are potentially able to be enable, enabled on the token that I have? So maybe here I could see if I had the SE debug privilege, I could optionally enable that. And then I would have vastly more capabilities available at my disposal for potential post exploitation techniques. Or I can see that this user is in fact part of domain admins and local admins. In this case, this is running from a um, medium privilege or medium uh, execution integrity process. So maybe I'd want to look at a UAC bypass to get to a high privilege process. So that's what I have for you today. This was uh, just an intro, kind of a taste of the sort of things that we're going to be talking about when we do this uh, monthly session. I'm going to go ahead and look at the chat. If you have any other questions, go ahead and throw them in. And I'm just going to scroll up to the top and address them as I go down. So to the question of um, using BOFs instead of normal shell commands gets you away from process creation, yeah, that's, that's one of your primary benefits. And correct, it would not be logging the commands that you ran, ran at that point, um, at least not as new process creation. So if you used, say, BSC commands and you created a new service, the new service creation would get logged but you wouldn't be necessarily executing through sc.exe to create that new service. So internally, um, the, the question is what boffs are kind of a must to have in your tool set. Internally, we load this repository and we have one that we call all uh, our remote ops boff repository. So, Everything that you see in the SA repo that we have out there publicly does some sort of enumeration, some kind of information gathering. So for instance, I just said using SC to create a service. So externally, we have being able to enumerate services, query services configurations, query their failure state. Internally, we have being able to modify a service, create a service, create a new scheduled task, things like that from uh, beacon object files. There's not a ton of um, 
other just repositories that we've consumed, we've noticed uh, with some of them, the code hasn't necessarily been thought out. So they might be doing things like call exit process as an error handling condition, which um, when you're running inside of a beacon object file is going to kill your process. So most of that stuff is just, as far as what we're using, the external repository that you see and then our internal repository. Uh, yep, execution is the fork and exec model. So yes, boffs are generally speaking more stealthy. And it's kind of twofold there. You're, you're bringing up an excellent point that AVs or ADRs could be hooking your address space or your beacon, and then could potentially be seeing those things, seeing the calls that you're making. There's two points there. Um, the first being, you can actually unhook your address space. I believe it's Silence that has a project out. And um, I'm going to take a risk and Google on the fly here. Uh, Raphael Mudge, the creator of Cobalt Strike, actually put out this unhook boff. So what you might optionally want to do is load in something like this, run it to unhook the EDRs from your address space, which I can tell you to date is not something that we've noticed EDRs detecting or rehooking after you've unhooked. And then you could probably safely run most of the other beacon object files that you would have interest in because those APIs are no longer going to be hooked. I will point out that some kernel callbacks do exist for things like opening handles. So you're not necessarily going to have free reign to just dump LSAS at that point, because it'll see that you opened up a handle to something like LSAS, and that's not something you're going to be able to unhook from user land. Um, but yeah, there are, it gives you a much wider range of options and flexibility in what you're able to try and do and try and accomplish outside of just running um, cmd.exe. Uh, specifically, it's because from user land, we can unhook things like uh, the jumps that might have been injected into something like NTDLL, the copy that's loaded into our address space. But when we make a function call, what's going to happen is it's going to transition to kernel space. So from user land to kernel space, and then uh, Microsoft provides callbacks that things like an EDR driver can uh, subscribe to, to be notified of a handle creation, what the handle's to, who's asking for it. And those are just things that we're not able to touch from a user land process. Well, to be able to unhook those kind of callbacks, we, you would need to actually load a driver and be running at ring zero uh, to be able to achieve that. So there's going to be a, a trade in terms of what you can actually do and, and not, depending on the EDR product and their capability. In fact, if you have Mimikatz on a, uh, on a test system, one of the things that you can actually do is you can install the Mimi driver, and it actually provides commands to enumerate callbacks, and you can actually see that Windows Defender, Sysmon, and many others are actually hooking for process creation, loading of modules, process, as Chris mentioned, process access. So typically what an EDR is going to be looking for and reporting with its driver is what processes are opening LSS. And it will keep a list of those and some of them are whitelisted. And then some other EDRs are more advanced and they will actually check the access mask that is being used and it will compare against that. And anything that does not match their list of known good behavior, it will actually flag and block. So 
uh, for the question that was just asked on, is it good to create BOFs that enumerate the domain? If you're targeted about your enumeration, it gives you another option to try and gather more information. Um, we actually, in the repository here, do have this LDAP search BOF that you can try and utilize to make queries against the domain. Um, so similar to like if you were using DS query. With that said, if you do something like try and make a query just globally for like all domain administrators through LDAP search or um, just trying to list off literally every user, that's a lot of information over the wire and making that type of query, depending on where some of the security solutions are in place, could get you detected. Now, with that said, at least for something like Cobalt Strike, your alternative would be uploading something like or getting on a server that had something like the DS query binary or running PowerShell commands to try and accomplish the same goal. So at that point, Both is giving you another vector to try and um, do some of those things. You're not limited to them being local commands that can be network-based commands. And at that point, it's just a matter of, you know, are solutions in place to detect the queries that you're making? So I hope that was helpful to you all. I'll probably give another like 30 seconds if anyone else has a question. Otherwise, as Carlos and I said at the beginning of this, this is going to be a monthly series. Sometimes I'll be taking points, sometimes Carlos will be taking point, where we're just going to talk about some tools and techniques that might be of interest to you guys. If you found this to be helpful, just keep an eye on Trusted Sex event page or our Discord or Twitter, and those will get announced there. And I look forward to talking to you all again next month.